Doctor from Lhasa, written by T. Lobsang Rampa, narrated by Clay Lomakayu. Authors Forward When I was in England, I wrote The Third Eye, a book which is true, but which has caused much comment. Letters came in from all over the world, and in answer to request I wrote this book, Doctor from Lhasa. My experiences, as will be told in a third book, have been far beyond that which most people have to endure, experiences which are parallel only in a few cases in history. That, though, is not the subject of this book, which deals with a continuation of my autobiography. I am a Tibetan Lama, who came to the Western world in pursuance of his destiny, came as was foretold, and endured all the hardships as was foretold. Unfortunately, Western people looked upon me as a curio, as a specimen who should be put in a cage and shown off as a freak from the unknown. It made me wonder, what would happen to my old friends, the Yetis, if the Westerners got hold of them, as they are trying to do? Undoubtedly, the Yeti would be sharp stuffed and put in some museum. Even then, People would argue and say that there were no such things as yetis. To me, it is strange beyond belief that Western people can believe in television and in space rockets that they may circle the moon and return and yet not credit yetis or unknown flying objects or in fact anything which they cannot hold in their hands and pull to pieces to see what makes it work. But now I have the formidable task of putting into just a few pages that which took before a whole book, the details of my early childhood. I came of a very high-ranking family, one of the leading families in Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. My parents had much to say in the control of the country, and because I was of high rank I was given severe training so that it was considered I should be fit to take my place. Then, before I was seven years of age, in accordance with our established custom, the astrologer priest of Tibet were consulted to see what type of career would be open to me. For days before this, preparations went forward, preparations for an immense party at which all the leading citizens, all the notabilities of Lhasa, would come to hear my fate. Eventually, the day of prophecy arrived. Our estate was thronged with people. The astrologers came armed with their sheets of paper, with their charts, and with all the essentials of their profession. Then, at the appropriate time when everyone had been built up to a high pitch of excitement, the chief astrologer pronounced his findings. It was solemnly proclaimed that I should enter a lamasary at the age of seven and be trained as a priest and as a priest-surgeon. Many predictions were made about my life. In fact, the whole of my life has been outlined. To my great sorrow, everything they said has come true. I say sorrow, because most of it has been misfortune, and hardship, and suffering. And it does not make it any easier, when one knows all that one is to suffer. I entered the Chakpuri Lamasari when I was seven years of age, making my lonely way along the path. At the entrance I was kept and had to undergo an ordeal to see if I was hard enough, tough enough, to undergo the training. This I passed, and then I was allowed to enter. I went through all the stages from an absolute raw beginner, and in the end I became a lama and an abbot. Medicine and surgery were my particular strong points. I studied these with avidity, and I was given every facility to study dead bodies. It is a belief in the West that the Lamas of Tibet never do anything to bodies if it means making an opening. The belief is, apparently, that Tibetan medical science is rudimentary, because the medical Lamas treat only the exterior and not the interior. That is not correct. The ordinary Lama, I agree, never opens a body. It is against his own form of belief. But there was a special nucleus of lamas, of whom I was one, who were trained to do operations, and to do operations which were possibly even beyond the scope of Western science. 
In passing, there is also a belief in the West that Tibetan medicine teaches that the man has his heart on one side, and the woman has her heart on the other side. Nothing could be more ridiculous. Information such as this has been passed on to the Western people by those who have no real knowledge of what they are writing about, because some of the charts to which they refer deal with astral bodies instead, a very different matter. However, that has nothing to do with this book. My training was very intensive indeed, because I had to know not only my specialized subjects of medicine and surgery, but all the scriptures as well because, as well as being a medical lama, I also had to pass as a religious one, as a fully trained priest. So it was necessary to study for two branches at once, and that meant studying twice as hard as the average. I did not look upon that with any great favor. But it was not all hardship, of course. I took many trips to the higher parts of Tibet. Lhasa is twelve thousand feet above sea level gathering herbs because we based our medical training upon herbal treatment, and at Chakpoi we always had at least six thousand different types of herb in stock. We Tibetans believe that we know more about herbal treatment than people in any other part of the world. Now that I have been around the world several times, that belief is strengthened. On several of my trips to the higher parts of Tibet, I flew in man-lifting kites, soaring above the jagged peaks of the high mountain ranges, and looking for miles and miles over the countryside. I also took part in a memorable expedition to the almost inaccessible part of Tibet, to the highest part of the Chantang Highlands. Here we of the expedition found a deeply secluded valley hidden between clefts in the rock, and warm warmed by the eternal fires of the earth, which caused hot waters to bubble out and flow into the river. We found, too, a mighty city, half of it exposed in the hot air of the hidden valley, and the other half buried in the clear ice of a glacier, ice so clear that the other part of the city was visible as if through the very clearest water. That part of the city which was then thawed out was almost intact. The years had dealt gently, indeed, with the buildings. The still air, the absence of wind, had saved the buildings from damage by attrition. We walked along the streets, the first people to tread those streets for thousands and thousands of years. We wandered at will through the houses which looked as if they were awaiting their owners. Until we looked a little more closely and saw strange skeletons, petrified skeletons, and then we realized that here was a dead city. There were many fantastic devices which indicated that this hidden valley had once been the home of a civilization far greater than any now upon the face of the earth. It proved conclusively to us that we were now as savages compared to the people of that bygone age. But in this, the second book, I write more of that city. When I was quite young, I had a special operation which was called the opening of the third eye. In it, a sliver of hard wood, which had been soaked in special herbal solutions, was inserted in the center of my forehead in order to stimulate a gland which gave me increased powers of clairvoyance. I was born markedly clairvoyant, but then, after the operation, I was really abnormally so and I could see people with their aura all around them as if they were wreathed in flames of fluctuating colors. From their auras I could divine their thoughts, what ailed them, what their hopes and fears were. Now that I have left Tibet, I am trying to interest Western doctors in a device which would enable any doctor and surgeon to see the human aura as it really is, in color. I know that if doctors and surgeons can see the aura, they can see what really affects the person, so that by looking at the colors and by the outline of the moving bands, the specialist can tell exactly what illnesses a person is suffering from. Moreover, this can be told before there is any visible sign in the physical body itself, because the aura shows evidence of cancer, TB, 
and other complaints many months before it attacks the physical body. Thus, by having such early warning of the onset of diseases, the doctor can treat the complaint and cure it infallibly. To my horror and very deep sorrow, Western doctors are not at all interested. They appear to think it is something to do with magic instead of being just ordinary common sense, as it is. Any engineer will know that high-tension wires have a corona around them, so has the human body, and it is just an ordinary physical thing which I want to show to the specialist, and they reject it. That is a tragedy, but it will come in time. The tragedy is that so many people must suffer and die needlessly until it does come. The Dalai Lama, the thirteenth Dalai Lama, was my patron. He ordered that I should receive every possible assistance in training and in experience. He directed that I should be taught everything that could be crammed into me, and as well as being taught by the ordinary oral system, I was also instructed by hypnosis and by various other forms which there is no need to mention here. Some of them are dealt with in this book or in the third eye. Others are so novel and so incredible that the time is not ripe for them to be discussed. Because of my powers of clairvoyance, I was able to be of great assistance to the inmost one on various occasions. I was hidden in his audience room so that I could interpret a person's real thoughts and intentions from the aura. This was done to see if the person's speech and thoughts tallied particularly when they were foreign statesmen visiting the Dalai Lama. I was an unseen observer when a Chinese delegation was received by the Great Thirteenth. I was an unseen observer, too, when an Englishman went to see the Dalai Lama, but on the latter occasion I nearly fell down in my duty because of my astonishment at the remarkable dress which the man wore, my first, very first sight of European dress. The training was long and arduous. There were temple services to be attended throughout the night, as well as throughout the day. Not for us the softness of beds. We rolled ourselves in our solitary blanket and went to sleep on the floor. The teachers were strict indeed, and we had to study and learn and commit everything to memory. We did not keep notebooks. We committed everything to memory. I learned metaphysical subjects as well. I went deeply into it. Clairvoyance, astral traveling, telepathy. I went through the whole lot. In one of my stages of initiation, I visited the secret caverns and tunnels beneath the Patala, caverns and tunnels of which the average man knows nothing. They are the relics of an age-old civilization which is almost beyond memory, beyond racial memory almost and on the walls were the records, pictorial records of things that flow in the air, and things that went beneath the earth. In another stage on initiation, I saw the carefully preserved bodies of giants, ten feet and fifteen feet long. I, too, was sent to the other side of death, to know that there is no death, and when I returned, I was a recognized incarnation with the rank of an abbot. But I did not want to be an abbot tied to a lamasary. I wanted to be a lama, free to move about, free to help others, as the prediction said I would. So I was confirmed in the rank of lama by the Dalai Lama himself, and by him I was attached to the Patala in Lhasa. Even then my training continued. I was taught various forms of Western science, optics, and other allied subjects. But at last, the time came when I was called once again to the Dalai Lama and given instructions. He told me that I had learned all that I could learn in Tibet, that the time had come for me to move on, to leave all that I loved, all that I cared for. He told me that special messengers had been sent out to Chongqing to enroll me as a student of medicine and surgery in that Chinese city. I was sick at heart when I left the presence of the inmost one and made my way to my guide, the Lama Minyar Dundap, and told him what had been decided. Then I went to the home of my parents to tell them also what had happened, 
that I was to leave Lhasa. The days flew by, and the final day came when I left Chapuri, when for the last time I saw Mingyar donned up in the flesh, and I made my way out of the city of Lhasa, the holy city on to the high mountain passes. And as I looked back, the last thing I saw was a symbol, for from the golden roofs of the Patala, a solitary kite was flying. Chapter One Into the Unknown Never before had I felt so cold, so hopeless, and so miserable. Even in the desolate waste of the Chantang Highlands, twenty thousand feet or more above sea level, where the grit laden sub zero winds whipped and cut to blood stained tatters any exposed skin, I had been warmer than now. There, the cold was not so bitter as the fearsome chill which I felt at my heart. I was leaving my beloved Lhasa. As I turned, I saw behind me diminutive figures on the golden roofs of the Patala, and above them a solitary kite dipped and bobbed in the slight breeze, dipped and bobbed as if to say, Farewell, your days of kite flying are over now, on to more serious matters. To me, that kite was a symbol, a kite up in the immensity of the blue held to its home by a thin cord. I was going off to the immensity of the world beyond Tibet, held by the thin cord of my love for Lhasa. I was going to the strange, terrible world beyond my peaceful land. I was indeed sick at heart as I turned my back upon my home and with my fellows rode off into that great unknown. They, too, were unhappy, but they had the consolation of knowing that after leaving me at Chungking, a thousand miles away, they could start off home. They would return, and on their journey back they would have the great consolation of knowing that every step they took brought them nearer to home. I had to continue ever on to strange lands, to strange people, and to stranger and stranger experiences. The prophecy made about my future when I was seven years old had said I should enter a lamissary and be trained first to the cella, then on to the state of a trappa, and so on, until in the fullness of time I could pass the examination of a lama. From that point, so the astrologers said, I was to leave Tibet, leave my home, leave all that I loved, and go out into what we termed barbarian China. I would journey to Chongqing and study to become a doctor and a surgeon. According to the priest astrologers, I would be involved in wars, I would be a prisoner of strange peoples, and I would have to rise above all temptation, all suffering, to bring help to those in need. They told me that my life would be hard, that suffering and pain and ingratitude would be my constant companions. How right they were. So with those thoughts in mind, not by any means cheerful thoughts, I gave the order to carry on forward. As a precaution, when we were just beyond sight of Lhasa, we dismounted from our horses and made sure that they were comfortable, that the saddles were not too tight, nor yet too loose. Our horses were to be our constant friends on the journey, and we had to look after them at least as well as we looked after ourselves. With that settled, and with the consolation of knowing that our horses were at ease, we remounted, and resolutely set our gaze forward, and rode on. It was early in 1927 when we left Lhasa and made our slow, slow way to Chotang on the river Brahmaputra. We had had many discussions as to the most suitable route, and this by way of the river and the Canting was recommended as being the most suitable. The Brahmaputra is a river which I know well having flown above one of its sources and arranged on the Himalayas when I had been fortunate enough to fly a man-lifting kite. We in Tibet regarded the river with reverence, but nothing like the reverence with which it was regarded elsewhere. Hundreds of miles away, where it rushed down to the Bay of Bengal, it was deemed to be sacred, almost as sacred as the Benares. It was the Brahmaputra, so we were told, which made the Bay of Bengal. In the earliest days of history, the river was swift and deep too, and as it rushed down almost in a straight line from the mountains, it scoured away the soft soil 
and made the wonderful bay, the glorious bay. We followed the river through the mountain passes in Sikang. In the old days, the happy days, when I was very young, Sikang was part of Tibet, a province of Tibet. Then the British made an incursion into Lhasa. After that, the Chinese were encouraged to invade, and so they captured Sikang. With murderous intent, they walked into that part of our country, killing, raping, and pillaging, and they took Sikang to themselves. They staffed it with Chinese officials. Officials who had lost favor elsewhere were sent to Sikang as a form of punishment. Unfortunately for them, the Chinese government gave them no support. They had to manage the best way they could. We found that these Chinese officials were mere puppets, helpless men, ineffectual men, at whom Tibetans laughed. Of course, at times we pretended to obey the Chinese officials, but that was mere politeness. When their back was turned, we went our own way. Our journey continued day after day. We made our halts convenient to bring us to a lamissary where we could stay the night. As I was a lama, indeed an abbot, a recognized incarnation, we were given the very best welcome which the monks could manage. Furthermore, I was traveling under the personal protection of the Dalai Lama, and that indeed counted heavily. We made our way to Canting. This is a very famous market town, well known for its sale of yaks, but particularly famous as an exporting center for the brick tea which we found so palatable in Tibet. This tea was brought from China. It was not just ordinary tea leaves, but more or less a chemical concoction. It had tea, bits of twig, soda, saltpeter, and a few other things in it, because in Tibet food was not the plentiful commodity that it is in some other parts of the world, and our tea had to act as a form of soup as well as drink. In Canting, the tea was mixed and made into blocks or bricks, as they were more commonly called. These bricks were such a size and weight that they could be loaded upon horses and later upon the yaks, which would carry them over the high mountain ranges to Lhasa, where they would be sold in the market and transported throughout Tibet. Ten bricks had to be of special size and shape, but they also had to be specially packed, so that if a horse stumbled in a mountain ford and tipped the tea into a river, no harm would be done. These bricks were packed tightly into a green hide, or as it is sometimes called, a raw hide, and were then quickly dipped in water. After this they would be put on rocks in the sun to dry. As they dried, they shrank. They shrank amazingly, and they absolutely compressed the contents. In drying, they took on a brown appearance, and they were as hard as bakelite, but very much stronger. Any of these hides, when dried, could be rolled down a mountainside and land safely and unharmed. It could be tipped into a river and perhaps stay there a couple of days. When fished out and dried, everything would be intact. No water would have entered, so nothing would be spoilt. Our bricks of tea in their dried hide cases were among the most hygienic packages in the world. Tea, by the way, was often used as currency. A trader who had no money with him could break off a lump of tea and barter with it. There was never any need to bother about cash while one had tea bricks. Canting impressed us with its business-like turmoil. We were used only to our own Lhasa, but here in Canting there were peoples from a lot of countries, from as far away as Japan, from India, Burma, and the Nomad people, from beyond the Takla Mountains. We wandered in the marketplace, mixed with the traders, and heard the strange voices in the different languages. We rubbed shoulders with monks of the different religions, of the Zen sect and others. And then, marveling at the novelty of it all, we made our way to a small lamissary on the road beyond Canting. Here we were expected. In fact, our hosts were getting rather worried that we had not arrived. We soon told them that we had been looking in the marketplace and listening to the market gossip. The abbot in charge made us very welcome and listened with avidity to our tales of Tibet, listened to the news we gave, for we came from the seat of learning, the Patala, and we were the men who had been to the Chantang Highlands and seen great marvels. Our fame had indeed preceded us. 
Early in the morning, after we had attended the service in the temple, we took to the road again on our horses, and carrying a small amount of food, Sampa with us. The road was a mere earth track high up on the sides of a gorge. Down below there were trees, more trees than any of us had ever seen before. Some were partly hidden by the mist set up by the spray of a waterfall. Giant rhododendrons also covered the gorge, where the ground itself was carpeted with varied hued flowers, small mountain flowers which scented the air and added color to the scene. We, though, were oppressed and miserable, miserable at the thought of leaving home and oppressed by the density of the air. All the time we were getting lower and lower, and we were finding it more and more difficult to breathe. There was another difficulty with which we were afflicted. In Tibet, where the air is thin, water boils at a lower temperature, and in higher places we could drink tea which was actually boiling. We kept our tea and water on the fire until all the bubbles gave warning that it was ready to drink. At first, in the lower land, we suffered greatly from scalded lips as we tried to gauge the temperature of the water. It was our habit to drink the tea straight from the fire. We had to do so in Tibet, otherwise the bitter cold would rob our tea of all heat. At that time we had no knowledge that the denser air would affect the boiling point, nor did it occur to us that we could wait for the boiling water to cool with no danger of it freezing. We were seriously upset by the difficulty in breathing, by the weight of the air pressing on our chest and on our lungs. At first we thought it was emotion at leaving our beloved Tibet. But later we found that we were being suffocated, drowned by air. Never before had any of us been below one thousand feet. Lhasa itself is twelve thousand feet high. Frequently we were living at even greater heights, when we went to the Chongtong Highlands where we were above twenty thousand feet. We had heard many tales in the past about Tibetans who had left Lhasa to go and seek their fortunes in the lowlands. Rumors said that they had died after months of misery with shattered lungs. The old wives' tale of the holy city had definitely made much ado of the statement that those who left Lhasa to go to the lower lands went to their painful deaths. I knew that there was no truth in that because my own parents had been to Shanghai where they had much property. They had been there and had returned safely. I had had little to do with my parents because they were such busy people. In such a high position, that they had had no time for us children. My information had been gleaned from servants, but now I was seriously perturbed about the feelings we were experiencing. Our lungs felt scorched. We felt that we had iron bands about our chests, keeping us from breathing. Each breath was a shuddering effort, and if we moved too quickly, pains like pain of fire shot through us. As we journeyed on, getting lower and lower, the air became thicker and the temperature warmer. It was a terrible climate for us. In Lhasa and Tibet, the weather had been very cold indeed, but a dry cold, a healthy cold, and in conditions like that, temperature mattered little. But now, in this thick air with so much moisture, we were almost at our wit's end to keep going. At one time the others tried to persuade me to order an about turn to return to Lhasa saying that we would all die if we persisted in our foolhardy venture. But I, mindful of the prophecy, would have none of it. And so we journeyed on. As the temperature became warmer, we became dizzy, intoxicated almost, and we seemed to have trouble with our eyes. We could not see as far as usual, nor so clearly, and our judgment of distances was all wrong. Much later I found the explanation. In Tibet, there is the purest and cleanest air in the world. One can see for fifty miles or more, and as clearly as if it were but ten. Here, in the dense air of the lowlands, we could not see so far, and what we could see was distorted by the very thickness of the air and by its impurities. For many days we journeyed along, getting lower and lower, traveling through forests containing more trees than any of us had ever dreamed existed. There is not much wood in Tibet, not many trees, and for a time we could not resist getting off our horses and running to the different sorts of trees, touching them, smelling them. They were all so strange to us and in such plenitude. 
The rhododendrons, of course, were familiar because we had many rhododendrons in Tibet. Rhododendron blossom was, in fact, a luxury article of food when properly prepared. We rode on, marveling at all we saw, marveling at the difference between this and our home. I cannot say how long we took, how many days, or how many hours, because such things did not interest us at all. We had plenty of time. We knew nothing of the scurry and bustle of civilization, nor, if we had known, would we have cared. We rode about eight or ten hours a day, and we stayed our nights at convenient lamasseries. They were not all of our own form of Buddhism, but no matter, we were always welcome. With us, with the real Buddhist of the East, there is no rivalry, no friction or rancor, and a traveler was always welcome. As was our custom, we took part in all the services while we were there. We lost no opportunity of conversing with the monks who were so keen to welcome us. Many were the strange tales they told us about the changing conditions in China, about how the old order of peace was changing, how the Russians, the men of the bear, were trying to indoctrinate the Chinese with political ideals, which to us seemed completely wrong. It seemed to us that what the Russians were preaching was, what is yours is mine, what is mine is staying mine. The Japanese as well, we were told, were making trouble in various parts of China. It appeared to be a question of, of overpopulation. Japan was producing too many children, and producing too little food. So they were trying to invade peaceful peoples, trying to steal from them, as if only the Japanese mattered. At last we left Sikang and crossed the border into Sichuan. A few more days and we came to the banks of the river Yangtze. Here, at a little village, we stopped late one afternoon. We stopped not because we had got to our destination for the night, but because there was a milling throng ahead of us, a meeting of some sort. We edged our way forward, and all of us being rather bulky, we had no difficulty at all in pushing our way to the front of the group. A tall white man was there, standing on an ox cart, gesticulating, telling of the wonders of communism, trying to exhort the peasants to rise up and kill the landowners. He was waving about papers with pictures on, showing a sharp-featured bearded man calling him the savior of the world. But we were not impressed with the picture of Lenin, nor with the man's talk. We turned away in disgust and carried on for a few more miles to the lamissary at which we were going to stay the night. There were lamissaries in various parts of China, as well as the Chinese monasteries and temples. For some people, particularly in Sikang, Sichuan, or, or Qinghai, prefer the form of Buddhism of Tibet, and so our lamissaries were there to teach those who were in need of our assistance. We never sought converts, we never asked people to join us, for we believed that all men were free to choose. We had no love of missionaries who went about ranting that one had to join such and such a religion to be saved. We knew that when a person wanted to become a Lamist, they would become so without any persuading on our part. We knew how we had laughed at missionaries who came to Tibet, who came to China. It was a standing joke that people would pretend to be converted just to get the gifts and the other so-called advantages which the missionaries were dispensing. And another thing, Tibetans and the old order of Chinese were polite folk. They tried to cheer the missionaries, tried to make them believe that they were having some success. But never, for one moment, did we believe what they were telling us. We knew that they had their belief, but we preferred to keep our own. We traveled on and followed the course of the river Yangtze, the river which I was later to know so well, because this was a pleasanter path. We were fascinated in watching the vessels on the river. We had never seen boats before, although some of us had seen pictures of them, and I had once seen a steamship in a special clairvoyant session, which I had had with my guide, the Lama Minyar Tonda, but that is detailed later in this book. In Tibet, our boatmen used coracles. These were very light frames covered with yak skin, and they would carry perhaps four or five passengers besides the boatman. Often a non-paying passenger would be the goat, which was the boatman's pet, but which also did its share on land because the boatman would load his personal belongings, his bundle or his blankets, onto the goat's back, 
while he would shoulder the coracle and climb the rocks, to avoid the rapids which otherwise would wreck his boat. Sometimes a farmer who wanted to cross a river would use a goat skin or a yak skin which had legs and other openings sealed off. He would use this contraption in much the same way as Westerners use water wings. But now we were interested to see real boats with sails, lanteen sails, flapping in the wind. One day we drew to a halt near some shallows. We were intrigued. Two men were walking in the river with a long net between them. Ahead of them two more men were beating the water with sticks and yelling horribly. We thought at first that these were madmen, and the ones with the net were following them to try to take them into custody. We watched, and then, at a signal from one of the men, the clamor stopped, and the two with the net walked together so that their paths crossed. Between them they drew taut the two ends of the net and dragged it ashore. Safely up on the sandy bank they tipped the net out, and pounds and pounds of shining, struggling fish dropped to the ground. It shocked us because we never killed. We believed that it was very wrong to kill any living creature. In our own rivers in Tibet, fish would come to touch a hand stretched in the water toward them. They would take food from one's hand. They had no fear whatever of man and were often pets. But here in China, they were just food. We wondered how these Chinese could claim to be Buddhist when they so blatantly killed for their own gain. We had dallied too long. We had sat by the side of the river for an hour, perhaps two hours, and we were unable to reach a lamissary that night. We shrugged our shoulders in resignation and prepared to camp by the side of the path. A little to the left, however, was a secluded grove of trees, with the river running through, and we made our way there, and dismounted, tethering our horses so that they could feed on the quite, to us, luxuriant herbage. It was a simple matter to gather sticks and to light a fire, and then we boiled our tea and ate our sampa. For a time we sat around the fire, talking of Tibet, talking of what we had seen on our journey, and of our thoughts for the future. One by one my companions yawned, turned away, and rolled themselves into the blankets and fell asleep. At last, as the glowing embers turned to blackness, I too rolled in my blanket and lay down but not to sleep. I thought of all the hardships I had undergone. I thought of leaving my home at the age of seven, of entering a lamissary, of the hardships, the severe training. I thought of my expeditions to the highlands, and further north to the great Chungtung highlands. I thought also of the inmost one, as we called the Dalai Lama, and then, inevitably, of my beloved guide, the Lama Minyar Dondap. I felt sick, with apprehension, heartbroken, and then it seemed as if the countryside was lit up as if by the noonday sun. I looked in amazement, and I saw my guide standing before me. Lapsang, Lapsang, he exclaimed. Why are you so downhearted? Have you forgotten? Iron ore may think itself senselessly tortured in the furnace, but as the tempered steel blade looks back, it knows better. You have had a hard time, Lapsang, but it is all for a good purpose. This, as we have so often discussed, is merely a world of illusion, a world of dreams. You have many hardships yet to face, many hard tests, but you will triumph, and you will overcome, and in the end you will accomplish the task which you have set out to do. I rubbed my eyes. Then it occurred to me, of course, the Lama Minyar Dondop had come to me by astral traveling. I had often done things like that myself, but this was so unexpected. It showed me so plainly that he was thinking of me all the time, helping me with his thoughts. For some time we communed with the past, dwelling upon my weaknesses and feeling, with a transient warm glow of happiness, the many happy moments when we had been together, like father and son. He showed me by mental pictures some of the hardships to be encountered, and more happily, the eventual successes, which would come to me in spite of all attempts to prevent it. After an indeterminate time, the golden glow faded as my guide reiterated his final words of hope and encouragement. With them as my predominant thoughts, I rode over beneath the stars in the frozen night sky, 
and eventually fell asleep. The next morning we were awake early and prepared our breakfast. As was our custom, we held our morning service, which I, as a senior ecclesiastical member, conducted, and then we continued our journey along the beaten earth track by the side of the river. About midday the river bore away to the right, and the path went straight ahead. We followed it. It ended at what to us appeared to be a very wide road. Actually, as I know it, actually, as I know now, it was, in fact, a second-class road. But we had never seen a man-made road of this type. We rode along it, marveling at the texture of it, marveling at the comfort of not having to look out for roots to avoid, not having to look for potholes. We jogged along, thinking that in two or three more days we would be at Chongqing. Then something about the atmosphere, something unexplained, made us glance at each other uneasily. One of us happened to look up to the far horizon. Then he stood upright in his stirrups in alarm, wide-eyed and gesticulating. Look, he said, a dust storm is approaching. He pointed ahead to where there was most certainly a gray-black cloud approaching at considerable speed. In Tibet there are dust clouds, clouds of grit-laden air, traveling at perhaps eighty miles an hour or more, from which all people except the yak must shelter. The yak's thick wool protects it from harm, but all other creatures, particularly humans, are lacerated and made to bleed by the stinging grit which scratches the face and hands. We were certainly disconcerted because this was the first dust storm we had seen since leaving Tibet, and we looked about us to see where we could shelter, but there did not appear to be anything suitable for us. To our consternation we became aware that the approaching cloud was accompanied by a most strange sound, a sound stranger than any of us had ever heard before, something like a temple trumpet being played by a tone-deaf learner, or, we thought miserably, like the legions of the devil marching upon us. Thrum, 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 it went. Rapidly the roar increased and became stranger and stranger. There were clatters and rattles with it. We were almost too frightened to do anything, almost too frightened to think. The dust cloud sped toward us faster and faster. We were terrified and almost paralyzed with fright. We thought again of the dust clouds in Tibet, but most certainly none had ever come at us with a roar. In panic we looked again to find some place of shelter, some place where we should be protected from this terrible storm which was coming upon us. Our horses were much quicker than we at making up their minds where to go. They broke formation, they reared, and they bucked. I had an impression of flying hooves, and my horse gave a most ferocious whinny, and seemed to bend in the middle. There was a strange tug, and a feeling that something had broken. Oh, my leg is torn off, I thought. Then my horse and I parted company. I sailed through the air in an arc, and landed flat on my back at the side of the road, stunned. Rapidly the dust cloud came near, and I saw inside it the devil himself, a roaring black monster shaking and shuddering. It came and it passed, flat on my back. Head a whirl I saw my first motor vehicle, a battered old ex-American lorry, traveling at its noisy top speed, driven by a grinning Chinese. The stench from it, devil's breath, we called it later, a mixture of petrol, oil, and manure. The load of manure which it carried was gradually being bounced off, and some of it was being jolted over the side to land with the splat beside me. With a clatter and a roar the lorry whizzed by, leaving clouds of choking dust and a plume of black smoke from the exhaust. Soon it became a weaving dot in the distance, weaving from side to side of the road, the noise abated, and there was no sound. I looked about me in silence. There was no sign of my companions. Perhaps even worse, there was no sign of the horse. I was still trying to disentangle myself because the broken part of the girth had twisted round my legs. When the others appeared one by one, looking shamefaced and highly nervous in case any other of these roaring demons should appear, we did not quite know what we had seen. It was all too quick, and the clouds of dust had obscured so much. The others sheepishly dismounted and helped me to brush the dust of the road off my garments. At last I was presentable again, 
But where was that horse? My companions had come from all directions, yet not one of them had seen my mount. We looked about. We called. We looked in the dust for any sign of hoof marks, but we could find no trace whatever. It seemed to us that the wretched animal must have jumped into the lorry and been carried off. No, we could find no trace whatever, and we sat down by the side of the road to discuss what to do. One of my companions offered to stay at a nearby hut so that I could have his horse, and he would get back on his companion's return when I should have been left at Chongqing. But I would have none of this. I knew as well as he did that he wanted a rest, and it did not solve the mystery of the missing horse. My companion's horses whinnied, and from a nearby Chinese peasant's hut, a horse whinnied in reply. It was soon stifled as if by a hand over the nostrils. Light dawned upon us. We looked at each other and prepared for instant action. Now, why should a horse be inside that poverty-stricken hut? That ramshackle building was not the home of a man who would own a horse. Obviously the horse was being concealed from us. We jumped to our feet and looked about us for stout clubs. Finding no suitable weapons about, we cut them from the nearby trees, and then we set off to the hut, a determined group suspicious of what was happening. The door was a rickety affair with thongs for hinges. A polite knocking produced no reply. There was dead silence, not a sound. Our rude demands for entry elicited no response. Yet previously a horse had whinnied, and its whinny had been suppressed. So we made a fierce onslaught on that door. For a short time it withstood our efforts. Then, as the thong hinges showed signs of parting and the door tilted and appeared to be on the point of collapse, it was hastily thrown open. Inside was a wizened Chinaman. Inside was a weazened Chinaman, his face contorted with terror. It was a wretched hovel, filthy, and the owner was a tattered rag bag of a man. But that was not what interested us. Inside was my horse with a bag round its muzzle to keep it quiet. We were not at all pleased with the Chinese peasant and indicated our disapproval in no uncertain manner. Under the pressure of our interrogation, he admitted that he had tried to steal the horse from us. We, he said, were rich monks and could afford to lose a horse or two. He was just a poor peasant. By the look of him, he thought we were going to kill him. We must have looked fierce. We had traveled perhaps eight hundred miles, and we were tired and rough-looking. However, we had no unpleasant designs upon him. Our combined knowledge of Chinese was entirely adequate to enable us to convey to him our opinion of his act, his probable end in this life, and his undoubted destination in the next. With that off our minds, and most certainly on his, we resaddled the horse, being very careful that the girth band was secure, and again we set off for Chongqing. That night we stayed at a small lamissary, very small. It had six monks in it but we were given every hospitality. The night after was the last night of our long journey. We came to a lamissary where, as the representatives of the inmost one, we were greeted with that courtesy which we had come to consider as our due. Again we were given food and accommodation. We took part in their temple services and talked far into the night about the events in Tibet, about our journeys to the great northern highlands, and about the Dalai Lama. I was very gratified to know that even here my guide, the Lama Mignar Tondap, was well known. I was interested, too, to meet a Japanese monk, who had been to Lhasa and studied our form of Buddhism, which is so different from that of the Zen. There was much talk of impending changes in China, of revolution, of a new order, an order in which all the landowners were to be thrown out and the illiterate peasants were to take their place. Russian agents were everywhere promising wonders, accomplishing nothing, nothing constructive. These Russians, to our minds, were agents of the devil, disrupting, corrupting, like plague destroying a body. The incense burned low and was replenished. It burned low again and again and was replenished. We talked on. Our talk was full of foreboding for the dire changes which were taking place. Men's values were distorted. Matters of the soul were not considered to be valuable nowadays, but only transient power. 
The world was a very sick place. The stars rolled in the sky. We talked on, and at last, one by one, we lay down where we were to sleep. In the morning, we knew our journey would come to an end. My journey for the time being, but my companions would return to Tibet, leaving me alone in a strange, unkind world where might was right. Sleep did not come to me easily that last night. In the morning, after the usual temple services and a very good meal, we set out again on the road to Chungking, our horses much refreshed. The traffic was more numerous now. Lorries and various forms of wheeled vehicles abounded. Our horses were restive, frightened. They were not accustomed to the noise of all these vehicles, and the smell of burnt petrol was a constant irritant to them. It was indeed an effort to stay in our high-peaked saddles. We were interested to see people working in the fields, the terrace fields, fertilized with human excreta. The people were clad in blue, the blue of China. They all seemed to be old, and they were very tired. They moved listlessly, as if life was too great a burden for them, or as if the spirit was crushed, and there was nothing more worth living and striving for. Men, women, and children worked together. We rode on, still following the course of the river which we had rejoined some miles back. At last we came in sight of the high cliffs on which the old city of Chongqing was built. To us this was the very first sight of any city of note outside Tibet. We stopped and gazed in fascination, but my gaze held not a little dread of the new life which lay before me. In Tibet I had been a power in the land through my rank, through my accomplishments and my close association with the Dalai Lama. Now I had come to a foreign city as a student. It reminded me all too vividly of the hardships of my early days, so it was not with happiness that I gazed at the scene ahead. This, I well knew, was but a step on the long, long track, the track which would lead me to hardships, to strange countries, stranger even than China, to the west where men worshipped only gold. Before a stretch rising ground with the terrace fields clinging precariously to the steep sides, at the top of the rise grew trees, which to us who had seen so few until recent days seemed to be a forest. Here, too, the blue-clad figures worked on in the distant fields, plodding along as their remote ancestors had plodded before them. One-wheeled carts drawn by small ponies rumbled along, laden with garden produce for the markets of Chongqing. They were queer vehicles. The wheel came up through the center of the cart, leaving space on each side for the goods. One such vehicle which we saw had an old woman balanced on one side of the wheel and two small children on the other. Chong King, end of the journey for my companions, the start of the journey for me, the start of another life. I had no friendship for it as I looked at the steep gorges of the swirling rivers. The city was built on high cliffs, quite thickly clothed with houses. From where we stood it appeared to be an island, but we knew better. We knew that it was not so, that it was surrounded on three sides by the waters of the rivers Yangtze and the Kialing. At the foot of the cliffs washed by the water was a long, wide strand of sand, taping off to a point where the rivers met. This was to be a spot well known to me in later months. Slowly we mounted our horses and moved forward. As we got nearer, we saw that steps were everywhere, and we had a sharp pang of homesickness as we climbed the seven hundred and eighty steps of the Street of Steps. It reminded us of the Patala, and so we came to Chongqing.